was the star of the 2016 Breeders' Cup. That was the last time Santa Anita hosted racing's championship weekend. Who will emerge as this year's star of stars when the Breeders' Cup returns to the great race place? That story begins today with the release of the pre-entries for all 14 championship races. And for that, we're joined by Mike Joyce and Gabby Gaudette, live at Santa Anita. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Santa Anita. That's right. This is the beginning of nine days of programming leading up to the Breeders' Cup here in Arcadia, California, November 1st and 2nd, with the full force of TVG's production value behind it. Gabby, Mike, we're going to take you through the pre-entries. This is where it all begins. We start getting a look at how these fields are going to take shape. Of course. And there's 187 horses pre-entered for those 14 races, 46 international interests. And, of course, it's coming back to Santa Anita for a record 10th time and make no mistake about it Santa Anita not only is a great venue in horse racing one of the great sporting venues of all time you won't find a better setting for championship competition at any sport in any venue in the entire world and we are pleased to have it back here in Southern California let's take a look at how they're going to organize the races this year two days of racing Friday and Saturday November 1st and 2nd so those of you who take off your Halloween costumes head right to the racetrack future stars Friday is where it all begins that's right and uh, taking a look at those, of course, it, uh, there are five races on that Friday. The Juvenile Turf Sprint, which was introduced last year for the first time. A Juvenile Phillies Turf, the Breeders' Cup Phillies, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf presented by Coolmore, and then the TVG Juvenile for $2 million. And then Championship Saturday, as we take a look, highlighted, of course, by the $6 million Breeders' Cup Classic. A ton of entry going into that race this year. Um, but a fantastic afternoon of racing, starting with the Philly Mare Sprint, the Turf Sprint, the Big Ass Fans, Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, the Maker's Mark Breeders' Cup Philly Mare Turf, the Breeders' Cup Sprint, the TVG Breeders' Cup Mile, the Long Jean Breeders' Cup Distaff, the Long Jean Breeders' Cup Turf, and the Long Jean Breeders' Cup Classic. So let's get right to it as we take a look. The first race on Friday, on Future Stars Friday, we're going to take a look at is that Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint. Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint is for those two-year-olds, five furlongs on the turf for a purse of $1 million. That race will go off at 1.12 p.m. Pacific time, and that will be the fifth race on the program. We start things off here. Twelve horses will be in the body of the race. In total, 26 horses were entered. Ah Ali starts it off, winning the Win and You're In Group 2 Norfolk at Royal Alley along with two other group ones in Europe for Simon Crisford. He will also send out Al Raya, who won the group three at Shanti. Another miracle, the son of American Pharaoh won the Skidmore at Saratoga for trainer Gary Contessa. We also have the likes of Band Practice, Cambria, who is the first of three Wesley Ward runners, a Chimney Rock, Dr. Simpson, Dream Shot, Fair Maiden. Now, Fair Maiden is cross-entered. Her, her first preference is for the Juvenile Phillies turf. This is her second preference. As we get to some other Wesley Ward runners, four-wheel drive, when the Breeders' Cup win in your end, grade three for 30 at Belmont. And Kamari won the Indian Summer at Keeneland. And then, of course, we have King Neptune, who also is cross-entered. Second preference for the, for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. And then that is the what comprises the fields here as i mentioned there are 12 horses in the body of the race but 26 horses were entered in total so uh taking a look at alligator alley to embolden and even beyond that to full flat there's a list of horses here who are on the also eligible list mike and they are in order of preference right and you know with um king neptune making his second preference in the juvenile and fair maiden with her first pre pre preference in the juvenile phillies turf possibly one of those slipping out would allow one of these two to slip in yep so we see and bold in there with the second preference uh the second preference in the breeders cup juvenile turf and then it rounds out there with full flat who has second preference in the juvenile the next race we're going to take a look at Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf presented by Coolmore and another one that is oversubscribed as far as pre-entries are concerned. That's right. There are 14 horses who will be entering the starting gate, but 21 horses were entered. In general here, Europeans have won the last or have won three out of the last five years of the running of this race. The Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf will be conducted at one mile for the two-year-old boys on the turf. 
for $1 million, American Theorem. This is the second preference for this horse. He has first preference in the juvenile. Andesite won the, or was second in the grade three pilgrim stakes at Belmont for Brad Cox. Arizona won the group two Coventry at Royal Ascot for trainer Aidan O'Brien. A decorated invader won the win in your end grade one summer stakes at Woodbond for Woodbine for Christophe Clement. Encoder, uh, Encoder, of course, we just mentioned, has first preference in the juvenile turf sprint. We also have Fort Myers, Graceful Kitten, Hit the Road, who recently won the Zuma Beach at Santa Anita. Our country, Peace Achieve, won the win in your end. Grade 3 Bourbon Stakes at Keeneland for Mark Cassie. Royal Doorknock uh, group, won the Group 2 Judmont Royal Lodge Stakes at Newmarket. And then we round out the field with Structure, Vitology, and War Beast for our trainer Doug O'Neill. And once again, we do have the list of also eligibles, uh, and it starts with Billy Bats, Gear Jockey, Proven Strategies, Embolden, Deviant, New World Tapestry, and Ano Dior. Again, in total, 21 horses entered for this race. And that little caveat at the bottom, this is the order of preference by the Breeders' Cup Racing Directors and Secretaries panel, as you see the uh, also eligibles, as we'll call them right now. Uh, continuing through Future Stars Friday, let's take a look at the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. As we take a look, it starts with a horse who's been super impressive for Bob Baffert in Bass. You can see $2 million on the line. It will go as race number seven on Future Stars Friday. Bass won the chandelier here at Santa Anita quite impressively. This would mark the third victory in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies should Bob Baffert score with this one. Also, British Idiom, impressive winner of the Darley Alcibiades at Keeneland for Brad Cox. Comical for Tim O'Neill was one of the first Phillies to really announce herself as a mainstay in the stakes ranks this year. Simon Callahan's Donna Veloce at Toile. First preference, Juvenile Phillies Turf. So this is her second choice. Jeff Mullins, KP Dreamin. And then Lazy Daisy, we saw winning the Pocahontas Stakes at Churchill Downs on the 14th of September for Team O'Neill. Mark Cassie has a pair with Perfect Alibi and 260. And then the Frazette winner, Wicked Whisper for Steve Asmussen. And these are all the horses that have signed up for this Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies, but a stout bunch. Once again, everybody else with a horse in this field looking for their first win in the Juvenile Phillies, except for Bob Baffert, who's won it twice before. Interesting. All right. On to the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies turf and here we start seeing an influx of those european horses they're always competitive on the grass and they've done quite well here at santa anita over the years juvenile phillies turf million dollars as you would expect going as race number eight of course will be conducted at one mile on the turf for those two-year-old fillies 14 horses will go postward in total 19 horses were entered we start with abskind at the top who won the win in your end grade one natalma at woodbine for eddie keneally very impressively we move along to albina sent out by john harrington uh, won the group one qatar pre marcel Bosac at a longchamp and then we take a look at alms Cristal, and even Daye, who won the Group 2 Shadwell Rockfell Stakes at Newmarket, Etoile, and Fair Maiden, two horses who we've already mentioned. This is their first preference. They have second preference in the Juvenile Phillies and the Juvenile Turf Sprint, respectively. Uh, Living in the Past is next, and then we get to Selflessly, who won the Great 2 Miss Grillo. And Mike, this is a race that Chad Brown has used to set up four out of the five winners in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies Turf that he's had, so a strong race in prep for this one. Shaden is next. We also have sharing for Graham Motion out of the Mayor Shared account who gave Graham Motion his win in the 2010 Philly and Mayor Turf. Sweet Melania was an impressive winner in the JP Morgan Jessamine Stakes at Keeneland. Tango and Walk in Marrakesh rounds out the field for trainer Ignacio Correas. Now we'll look at the also eligibles and we start with Precious Moment and it goes all the way down to Apple Cross here. Once again, these horses are listed in the order of preference by the Breeders' Cup Racing Directors and Secretaries panel. Well, there's a look at it. Let's take a look at the uh, entries for the TVG Breeders' Cup Juvenile, one of two races that TVG puts their name on in this year's Breeders' Cup. $2 million. It'll go as the ninth and final Breeders' Cup race on Friday as we take a look. So Bob Baffert, we know his uh, exploits with two-year-olds and he does not spare the juvenile. He's won it four times, including last year with game winner, and he has eight rings, winner of the American Pharaoh here at Santa Anita on the 27th of September. Now, you see you have five horses in here that are cross-centered. American Theorem, this will be his first choice. Talented runner by American Pharaoh for George Papa Padromo. Anodor and Billy Bats. Now, Billy Bats is on the outside looking in in the juvenile turf, but he actually makes the body of the juvenile. We'll see what Peter Miller can do when entries actually come around. Dennis's moment, we talked about the Iroquois uh, winner for Dale Romans. Full flat. 
first preference will be the juvenile turf sprint. King Neptune, the Aiden O'Brien runner, another one whose first preference will be the juvenile turf sprint. But don't forget, Aiden O'Brien won this race in 2001 with the very talented Johannesburg. Maxfield, this is a horse that's going to get a lot of attention leading into the TVG Breeders' Cup Juvenile. As impressive a winner as we have seen in the two-year-old ranks this year with that victory in the Claiborne Breeders' Futurity at Keeneland for Brendan Walsh. I know they are very high on the chances of this one. Scabbard for Eddie Keneally, Shoplifted for Steve Asmussen, Peter Erton with Storm the Court, and Wrecking Crew, another one for the Peter Miller Barn. Right now, we're going to uh, take a break from listing the entries and actually talk to the connections of some of the entries, including the Hall of Fame trainer Bob Baffert, who's standing by right now with Christina Blacker. There will be several horses pre-entered for Hall of Famer Bob Baffert, but we're focusing on the juvenile. We'll start here with eight rings. Bob, you know what it takes to win this race. What's the most important thing about preparing a juvenile this time of year? First, you have to have a really good horse. And, um, and also, you, they have to be healthy. They have to be, uh, uh, you know, it's nice to have couple races into them and uh, two turn race really is important for this uh, but uh, mainly you know you need a top horse that last race was so important for him Johnny Velasquez saying that he's still kind of learning and getting confidence in what he needs to do out there are you seeing that development yeah when Johnny you know taking the mount you know I told him you know are you sure you want to take this mount and because uh, it was pretty dangerous what he that little stun he pulled at Del Mar and uh, and he was fine with it he says I'm just gonna you know I'm going to get run on his mind early so he can't, doesn't have time to think about it, and he did. And uh, probably use him a little bit more than we would have liked him to use, but I think he just wanted me focused. And he got to know him in that race, and so, um, you know, I, I told him, you know, we, we work, and when he's next to other horses, he's really, he can relax. doesn't have to be out there going too fast early, but, uh, you know, he was pretty impressed with him. Uh, the horse has gears. He's, uh, he's still a little green, but they're all a little green, but uh, he is just so fast. We're still a ways away from the race, but have you decided if you want to send him away from there and get his mind on running in the juvenile or just let him find his own space? Yeah, I really don't. Uh, I think Johnny, I really don't give him a lot of instructions. I think he'll, you know, get him into the race, uh, you know, because, you know, just to get him into it. I think the post is going to be a, a big factor. But, uh, you know, he knows him now. I don't really have to say too much to him now. So, uh, you know, once he's ridden once, it's pretty much they're on their own. All right, good luck. Thank you. Bob Baffert, eight rings in the juvenile. Of course, you'll see his name pop up on many more graphics as we continue the pre-entry show. So much promise and excitement with those two-year-olds on Future Stars Friday. I know everyone's looking forward to it. It's a great way to kick off the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Again, uh, we have those five juvenile races on uh, Future Stars Friday, and then we pick things up on Championship Day Saturday. With a really fun race in the Breeders' Cup Philly Mare Sprint, we're going to take a look. This will be the first of the championship races on Saturday for the Breeders' Cup, um, November 2nd. Interesting bunch. Million dollars for the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint. It'll be race number four. That is the first Breeders' Cup race of the day. Uh, Bella Fina shows up here for Simon Callham. Very talented. Which Bella Fina do we get, though? Come Dancing for Carlos Martin was an impressive winner of the Kettle One Ballerina at Saratoga on the 24th of August. Kofifi for Brad Cox. Danuska's My Girl for Dan Ward. Dawn the Destroyer for Kieran McLaughlin. Heaven Has My Nikki for Bob Hess. She's really turning into a fantastic runner. Uh, Richard Baltus, no barn in the country as hot as the Baltus camp. They have Lady Ninja here. Most Sea Cal and Secret Spice for Peter Miller and Richie Baltus both have first preference in the distaff. Selcourt has been a talented runner for John Sadler. And then Serengeti Empress, your Kentucky Oaks winner for Tom Amos in this one. This is her second preference. Her first preference is the distaff. I would expect to see her go there, but we shall see. And then Spice Perfection for Peter Miller. Won the Thoroughbred Club of America Stakes, a Breeders' Cup win in your in at Keeneland on the 5th of October. All right, that's a very nice lineup, a very talented. I mean, you could make a case for any of those. It, I think that's going to be one of the most intriguing races on Saturday. That's a tough race to start on for the gamblers, that is for certain. Let's take a look at the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint as we have a talented field in this one as well. Gabby, it will, what do we have to expect? All right, well, it's going to go off at race on race five at 12:33 uh, p.m. Pacific time, it will be run at five furlongs for those three-year-olds and up on the turf for one million dollars. Here we look at the field, and history could be made if Stormy Liberal can pull off a win here, as he's looking for that third victory in this race. But we started off with Belvoir Bay, a one of three entrants for trainer Peter Miller. Eddie Haskell is next, followed by Fairyland, who won the Group One Daringston, a stud flying five stakes at the Curra for. 
Aiden O'Brien. We have Imprimis in there, Legends of War, Leinster for Rusty Arnold, who has been in very good form here recently, Ohm for Peter Miller, who's cross-entered. He has second preference in the Breeders' Cup mile. And then we get Pure Sensation, who is the old war horse. He's approaching $2 million in earnings, most recently winning the Grade 3 Troy last out. As so perfect will be the three-year-old fillies going against the boys in here, followed by uh, Stormy Limerell. He actually won this race in 2017, 2018, so he's looking for that record third win in this race. Stubbins, impressive runner for trainer Doug O'Neill, most recently set the uh, new course record in the Grade 2 Woodford at Keeneland. And then we have Totally Boss, who won the win and you're in grade three Kentucky Downs turf sprint for Rusty Arnold. So Rusty Arnold with two runners in that race. We'll get to the list of also eligibles. We start with Final Frontier, Shecky Shabazz, Girls Know Best, and Double Touch. A total of 16 horses entered in the Breeders' Cup turf sprint. And then we get to our next race, which year in and year out provides one of the more exciting finishes. I don't know why it always happens like this, but it does. The Big Ass Fans Dirt Mile. Let's go through this field, and you've got a, a situation with the win in your end that's uh, quite unusual, and you don't see this in any of the other Breeders' Cup races this weekend. Race number six is the Big Ass Fans Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, because it's 410 Eastern, 110 Pacific. Blue Chipper in for Kim Young Kwan. Catalina Cruiser, Diamond Ops, Forense Fire, Hog Creek Hustle all have their first preference in the sprint rather than the Big Ass Fans Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. Catalina Cruiser won the Pat O'Brien for John Sadler, which is a win in your end for the Dirt Mile. However, likely to go in the, in the sprint because they want to avoid Omaha Beach. Omaha Beach ran a big-ass race in the Santa Anita Sprint, but is going to go in the Big-Ass Fans Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile because he's not a sprinter, even though he beat one of the fastest horses in the country in Chancelot. So it's quite interesting that we don't really have a win and you're in horse coming into the Dirt Mile. However, you have a tough field with Omaha Beach in the body of it. Great expectations for Peter Erton, a local horse. You have Improbable for Bob Baffert, Mr. Money for Brett Calhoun, Spun to Run for Juan Carlos Guerrero, and Whitmore, whose first preference is fit for Ron Moquette. Now, there are some horses that are trying to get in that aren't in the body of this race, but likely Snapper Sinclair, uh, Tres Flor, and Ambassadorial will get in should they want to, even though one of those horses' first preference is the Turf Mile, because you would think three or four of these horses at least are going to defect. Also, should be noted, that one of the prep races for the Big Ass Fans Dirt Mile was the Met Mile. Matoli ran fantastic that day. His preference is clearly going to be the sprint. Yeah. So he's not even pre-entered in the Dirt Mile. So the Dirt Mile, it, it, it is quite interesting. But we might see one of the most talented horses, if not the most talented horse of the weekend in Omaha Beach. And it, it is an interesting race in the, where the Breeders' Cup goes in mm -hmm. terms of a venue because it can go from a one-turn mile to a two-turn mile. So it really is a true test, I think, going the two-turn mile here at Santa Anita. So let's uh, keep it moving with the Maker's Mark Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf. The uh, Philly and Mare Turf will be running for a purse of $2 million. And there's a look at the pre-entries. Take us through this field. It will be run at a mile and a quarter there on the turf uh, and go postward as race seven on that Saturday program. It's been a mix-up of who's been more successful in terms of the Europeans and North American trainers. Chad Brown has had three wins in this race. Europeans have won it eight times in the past. A field of 13 will line up. We start with Billiston Brook, who won the Group 1 King of Bahrain Sun Chariot Stakes at Newmarket for Richie Hannon. Castle Lady with a nice second performance, most recently in the QE2 at Keeneland. We also have Fanny Logan in there, who won the Group 3 at Newmarket. Fleeting, who was forced to sit Mr. Charlie in the Beverly D. She's going to hope to turn the tables on her. We have Iridessa, who has cross-entered with first preference in the Breeders' Cup Mile. We also have Just Wonderful, who was second in the Belmont Oaks. She has second preference in the Mile, first preference to this race. We have Magical in here. with Her first preference is in the Breeders' Cup Turf. Mirth, who won the Win in Your End Grade 1 Rodea Drive at Santa Anita for Phil D'Amato. Mississippi, she also is one that's cross-entered. First preference here, second preference in the turf and then of course sister charlie three races this year three wins this year all grade ones the diana the beverly d and the flower bowl it's chad brown will also send out thais and basilica is after her villa marina wraps up the field who won the group one pre de l'opera and uh, overall i thought that was just a really deep field but of course all eyes will be on the likes of sister charlie 
Ooh, I know. I know it says there that Magical has first preference in the turf, but who wouldn't want to see the matchup of Sister that Charlie would be Magical? Amazing. We'll see if she comes. Uh, let's take a look at the Breeders' Cup Sprint. Every year, it's a fantastic race, and I think the most exciting race going in. You just don't get better than this. At the highest levels of our game, horses just running at the, the highest speeds available to a thoroughbred, going six furlongs. The Breeders' Cup Sprint. Of course, it's a great one. $2 million on the line. Let's take a look at the field. So all the horses that are cross-entered in the Breeders' Cup Sprint and other Breeders' Cup races, this is their first preference. Whitmore, going from the bottom up here. Hog Creek Hustle, Forensic Fire, Diamond Ops, Ops, and Catalina Cruiser. Catalina Cruiser opting for this spot. The word is they're trying to avoid Omaha Beach because he's just that good. Um, I don't think it matters for Catalina Cruiser because he is as talented a sprinter as he is a two-turn horse. Diamond Ops for Patrick B. N. Cohn. And then Engage, who... Seems just like Diamond Oops, excuse me. Uh, Engage, who won the Stoll Keenan Ogden Phoenix at Keeneland on the 4th of October for Steve Asmussen, really looking like the now horse. You have Forensic Fire, Hog Creek Hustle, their uh, exploits are well documented. The Vosburg winner, an Imperial Hint. Uh, Landeskog for Team O'Neill, also owned in part by Eric Johnson, named after his uh, teammate on the Colorado Avalanche, Matera Sky. Matoli, we mentioned, actually won the Breeders' Cup Challenge Race, the winning you're in for the big-ass fans, Dirt Mile, opting for this part, spot because he's such a brilliant sprinter. Chancelot ran the fastest sprint race we saw all year long for Jorge Navarro when he was in Saratoga, and then Whitmore for Ron Moquet. Uh, we are moving our way back to the turf here with the TVG Breeders' Cup Mile, um, a race outside of the Breeders' Cup Classic that has given us more horses of the year than any other Breeders' Cup race here in the U.S. And it's incredible. It's an incredible lineup once again this year. Five horses in total won those challenge races, the Breeders' Cup winning your in races. So a lot of implications there. And, of course, $2 million on the line for the TVG Breeders' Cup Mile for the three-year-olds and up. We'll start with two horses that actually did win those Breeders' Cup winning your in races and Bolo, who won the Grade 1 Shoemaker Mile at Del Mar. Bowie's Hero, who recently won the Grade 1 Shadwell Turf Mile at Keeneland for Phil D'Amato. You see Brooks and Mortar in there, who is gives the first preference to the Breeders' Cup turf. Circus Maximus. We also have El Tormenta in there, who won the Woodbine Mile. Got Stormy. The filly that beat the boys in the Grade 1 four-star Dave. She'll hope to do that once again, going against the boys here. We we have Hey Hey Gammon and also Iridessa, who's a two-time Group 1 winner this year, winning the Group 1 Coolmore Fastnet Rock, Rock Matron for Joseph O'Brien. She has second preference in the Philly and Mare Turf. Just Wonderful has first preference in the Philly and Mare Turf. Line of Duty, who won the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf back in 2018. Lord Glitters, who won the Grade 1 Queen Anne at Royal Ascot. And then the field wraps up with Space Traveler, True Valor, and Uni, who has two Two grade one wins this year, including the First Lady and the Matriarch at Del Mar. We'll take a look at some of those on the also eligibles. And there's a lot in here, uh, Mike. There's 14 horses that will go postward, but 22 horses were entered into this race. We started with Asu Dwa, Trey Fluar, Luke Cullen without parole, Caribou Club, Neck Shares, Ohm, and Snapper Sinclair for that total of 22. It's a nice look there at the TVG Breeders' Cup Mile. Now we're going to take a look at one of three races sponsored by Longines, who have been great supporters of horse racing um, for a long time now, and especially the Breeders' Cup. Hey, check it out. You can see the clock right over my shoulder. Um, let's take a look at the Longines Breeders' Cup distaff. And the distaffers have taken advantage of the Breeders' Cup Challenge Series more so than any other division, it would seem. Because not only do we have the most winners of Breeders' Cup winning your in races in the field of this race, we have more horses running in those races than any other one. Let's take a look. Um, Blue Prize won the Judd Not Spinster at Keeneland just a few weeks ago, a win and you're in. Um, Elate, whose first preference is the Classic, did win the Fleur de Lis, which is a win and you're in. That was back at Churchill Downs on the 15th of June. Midnight Bisu won two Challenge Series races, as her name is firmly entrenched in Horse of the Year conversation. She won the Ogden Phipps at Belmont and the Personal Ensign at Saratoga for Steve Asmussen, who won this race back in 2014 with Untappable, if you'll remember the final race ride for Rosie Napravnik. Mosi Cal, second preference is the Philly Mare Sprint, but Peter Mallow would rather go here in the distaff. Ollie's Candy won the Clement Hirsch at Del Mar back on the 28th of July for John Sadler. Then we get to Paradise Woods who won the Zenyatta at Santa Anita for trainer John Sheriffs, who trained Zenyatta, who also won the Zenyatta when it was the Lady Secret. Also, John Sheriffs won this race in 2008 with Zenyatta, and he won it in 2009 when Zenyatta won the Breeders' Cup Classic 
with Life is Sweet. So he's looking for his third victory in this race with Paradise Woods. Secret Spice and Serengeti Empress both have their second preference in the Philly Amir Sprint, but Richie Baltus and Tom Amos would like these two horses in this event. Street Band won the Cotillion in impressive fashion for Larry Jones at Parks on the 21st of September, and she is looking like a horse that is on the improve in the way up, and you can never discount Chad Brown. Wowcat rounds out the pre-entries for the $2 million Long Jean Breeders' Cup Distaff. All right, nice line up there. Well, you were mentioning the Sister Charlie and Magical mm -hmm. matchup. Yeah. What about Sister Char or what about Magical and Bricks and Mortar? I wouldn't mind seeing that either. Could be a doozy. <laughs> take a look at the Long Jean Breeders' Cup turf, two of the sharpest horses, one a filly, one a colt. Um, Bricks and Mortar has been simply sensational. He'll be headlining the American contingent in the Long Jean Breeders' Cup turf. Four million dollars on the line for this mile and a half race. Fourteen horses were entered. Fourteen horses will likely run. And as I mentioned, you get a horse who's arguably one of the best in North America in Bricks and Mortar, Mortar and one of the best fillies in Europe in Magical. Both have first preference for the Breeders' Cup turf. But we start with Acclimate, who did win that Breeders' Cup winner you're in, the Grade 2 Del Mar Handicap for Phil D'Amato. Al Nuak is next. We also have Anthony Van Dyke for trainer Aiden O'Brien. Arklo winning the Grade 1 Joe Hirsch Classic at, most recently at Belmont Park. Bandua for trainer Jack Sisterson, a horse who's been very versatile and in good form so far this year. Bricks and Mortar, a perfect 5 for 5 and has earned $4.5 million in earnings this year alone, including wins in the Arlington Million and the Grade 1 Manhattan. We also have Channel Cat in here for trainer Todd Pletcher and Channel Maker, who won the Grade 1 Mano War for trainer Bill Mott. Magical, the filly that I was mentioning, has won two Group 1s this year, including the Irish Champion Stakes and almost upset Enable in the Coral Eclipse. She ran second in this race to the Great Enable last year. Mount Everest is next, followed by Mississippi, who has second preference in this race, first preference in the Philly and Mare Turf, Old Persian, United, Zulu Alpha, all wrap up this wonderful field of the Longines Breeders' Cup turf. And then there was one. We have only one race left to discuss here on pre-entries for the Breeders' Cup, and that is the Longines Breeders' Cup Classic. It's the heavyweight division in horse racing here in the United States of America. Older horses, 10 furlongs on the main track here, and we've seen some truly historic performances in the vista of the San Gabriel Mountains here. This is how they're going to line up. Code of Honor, winner of the Jockey Club Gold Cup and perhaps the best three-year-old in the country for Suge McGahey. Still trying to avenge that loss with Easy Goer oh, about 30 years ago. Higher Power for John Sadler. He was winner of the TVG Pacific Classic. Late, the Philly, we talked about her in the distaff, but Bill Mott looking like he's going to try and get his second victory in the Classic. Of course, he won with Cigar back in 95 with the Philly. John Sadler won the race, of course, a year ago with Accelerate. Math Wizard for Safi Joseph, truly one of the great moments of uh, the year was uh, Safi Joseph. McKenzie, he won the Whitney at Saratoga. That was a win and you're in here for the Breeders' Cup Classic. He has been the highest ranked horse in the Classic Division throughout the year. And Bob Baffert won three consecutive runnings of this race. He's looking for his fourth win. Mongolian Groom, upset winner of the Awesome Again, beating, if we're mentioned, McKenzie for Enabish Gambat. We didn't know if he was going to make it, but they uh, ponied up the supplemental fee, and they are running. Owendale for Brad Cox, seeking the soul, winner of the Stephen Foster. The Breeders' Cup Challenge Series race on the 15th of June at Churchill Downs for Dallas Stewart. Vino Rosso, don't forget he crossed the wire first in the Jockey Club Gold Cup. There was a disqualification. The connections were not happy. A lot of redemption on the line there. War of Will for Mark Cassie, and then Yoshida for Bill Mount rounds out. The pre-entries for this year's 2019 Breeders' Cup Classic brought to you by Longines. And just moments ago, Christina caught up with uh, the assistant to Bill Mont, the one and only Riley Mont. And to his father, Bill, joins me now. Two pre-entered in the Classic and sort of a decision we were all waiting for with a late first preference to the Classic. Ultimately, what pushed you all in this direction? Um, well, obviously, she has a very good record at a mile and a quarter. Um, she's run very well at a mile and an eighth uh, against, you know, uh, females. Um, but, you know, this is her swan song. She'll be retired after this race. And we figured she deserves a shot at the distance. How about Yoshida? You're going to have Mike Smith aboard. What led to that change? Well, Joelle uh, opted to take the mount on McKinsey. Um, and Mike's a pretty good replacement. Um, we're happy about that. He's won a classic for us as well as many other grade ones so 
Uh, we have a lot of confidence in, in the rider uh, and the horse as well. He's been training very well since the Woodward, and uh, he's taken a liking to this racetrack, I think. Both of your horses ship very well. You've been chipping with them and kind of all across the country. What is it about them that enables them to sort of take their racetrack anywhere? Well, they're classy animals, first of all. Um, you know, they, they've, like you said, have been all over, especially Yoshida. He's been to England, Dubai, and, and obviously Japan, where he was bred. Um, you know, both, both horses uh, really, you know, enjoy the travel. And I think when you ship, you know, across the country, you just look for the obvious signs of, um, you know, appetite and, and uh, energy level and things like that. And uh, to this point, we've seen all positives. You've been here at Santa Anita since Sunday. How are they taking to this track, and what are your plans in the next week and a half? Great. They've had several gallops over the course. Um, they've walked through the paddock post-gallop uh, several times. Um, we look to probably breeze them Saturday or Sunday and then uh, just keep them happy until race day. It's, uh, we just try to keep things simple and not, not veer from our routine. Channel maker here as well for the turf. What's the update on him? How's he training? Great. He ran a very credible race in, in the Joe Hirsch at Belmont. Um, got beat by a good horse uh, just in the last final yards. Um, you know, he's run over the course. Uh, he enjoys being here, and he's sort of a hard-knocking animal against, uh, you know, the American turf horses. Um, whether he stacks up against the, the Europeans that come over, uh, that remains to be seen, but we're, we're confident in how he's training. It's an exciting week. Thanks for the time, and good luck. Thank you. Riley Mott, three, pre-entered her team, Mott, and that exciting decision. A late will take on the boys in the Breeders' Cup Classic. For totally different reasons, you would think the victory of a late in the Breeders' Cup Classic would be equally as exciting as Cigar winning at 95. Yeah, absolutely. And it's kind of cool that it's the 10-year anniversary of Zenyatta winning the Breeders' Cup mm -hmm. Classic. So uh, timely there, but of course a decision really coming because of the distance. Yeah. He's just better suited to the distance of the Classic. Well, and the lack of a standout other than McKenzie in the division, mm -hmm. why wouldn't you take a talented filly or mare against the boys in the Classic division this year? I think it's a great idea. The Breeders' Cup is so close. Nine days of programming beginning with today here on TVG, leading up to the championships here at Santa Anita on November 1st and 2nd. We take a look at the races once again. Um, you will see all these races on TVG. We will start the day at 145 Eastern. We have a couple of allowance events. You have some Golden State Juvenile Series with the Phillies and the uh, Juvenile, and then the Breeders' Cup races. And we close it out with the marathon. Not technically a Breeders' Cup race anymore, but we've still continued to run it, even though it's been stripped of its Breeders' Cup status because, well, it's just an outstanding event, and it's a great betting affair to close the day out on. It really is. So there you have it, a lineup of 10 for Future Starts Friday. And I'd imagine some of those undercard races are just as challenging as some of the Breeders' Cup races. But, of course, Future Starts Friday, uh, we never know what we're going to see, some stars in the making. Go back on the uh, juvenile races over the last, you know, so many years and, and do a little revisionist history mm -hmm. and see who we thought was going to be good going in and who came out looking like King Kong. Uh, championship Saturday, greatest day of racing in the world, and that's not hyperbole. Starts off at 107 Eastern with the Senator Ken Maddy, the Damascus, the Cutter Twilight Derby. Then we get into the Breeders' Cup races, starting with the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint at 255 race number four. The Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint, the Big Ass Fans Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, the Makers Mark Philly and Mare Turf, the Breeders' Cup Sprint, the TVG Mile, and the Long Jean Breeders' Cup Distaff, the Long Jean Breeders' Cup Turf, and the Long Jean Breeders' Cup Classic. And that will go at 844 Eastern, 544 Pacific. In years past here in California, when we've had the Breeders' Cup, they've sometimes cheated that post time up to get more of a, a daylight crowd on the East mm -hmm. Coast. This year we're running it on West Coast time zones, which I actually think is a great decision. What do you think that? Because I think that the I mean, East, I agree with you. <laughs> because I think it's easier to get people on the East Coast to gamble at 8.44 p.m. Eastern than to try and push all of us up I at 3 totally o'clock and get our you. bets in. And I don't want to get shut out. Uh, at any rate, you can enjoy all kinds of programming leading up to the Breeders' Cup. This is going to be the biggest buildup you've ever seen on network television anywhere, regardless of network for the Breeders' Cup. And it starts here with the pre-entries, and then tomorrow we get rolling with breakfast at the Breeders' Cup. It actually starts Friday the 25th through Halloween. You will be joined by Simon and Todd, Joaquin, Michelle Yu. And 
It's going to have a, a works look and feel, but it's going to be much more than that. It's going to happen every day in the lead up to the Breeders' Cup weekend. It's going to happen from 10 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 to 10.30 Pacific. And it's we're obviously going to be showing all of the works, but also catching up with the connections of horses, not only the trainers and the owners and the jockeys, but beyond that. So it's going to be an exciting couple of days leading into the biggest weekend in racing. This is TVG at its finest, by the way. A works-type format for breakfast at the Breeders' Cup. You will see no finer programming revolving around horse racing leading up to the Breeders' Cup than this. We're going to take a break. We'll be back and wrap up the pre-entries after this. Do you want to bet the next race and don't have a TVG account? Get the TVG mobile app and sign up. It's fun, easy, and it's TVG. I'll show you how it works. When you bet the horse that wins, you win money too. With the TVG app, select your horse, bet type, and wager amount. Place your bet and watch the race live. Download the app and sign up now, or go to TVG.com. Join now and get a risk-free bet up to $200. TVG, your best bet. TVG, November 1st and 2nd. Breeders' Cup races live. Two action-packed days from Santa Anita. The Breeders' Cup World Championships on TVG. Starts Friday, November 1st, Santa Anita, 145 Eastern, 1045 Pacific. They say less is more, but we believe more is more. That's why we build FanDuel Sportsbook with more, more, more ways to bet. More ways to fund your account, more ways to cash in, and more ways to cash out. With payouts delivered straight to your bank account in as little as 48 hours. You want more? You got it. Join today and get a risk-free bet worth up to $500. FanDuel Sportsbook. More ways to win. Welcome to the Breeders' Cup pre-entry show here live from Santa Anita, the host for the 10th time of the Breeders' Cup here in Arcadia, California, alongside Gabby Gaudetta, I'm Mike Joyce. We've seen who's pre-entered. Now let's start talking about some of the races and the body of which, look, the Breeders' Cup Classic, it's always the main event. It doesn't matter the year. This year, we have a lot of entry going in, and perhaps the most exciting prep race was the one that resulted in disqualification, the Jockey Club Gold Cup from Belmont Park. Yeah, and taking a look at Code of Honor in that race, of course, Vino Rosso uh, and uh, Code of Honor was placed first via disqualification. But, you know, what's interesting about Code of Honor, Mike, is going back to last year, mm -hmm. I can remember Shug McGahee talking to him as he was prepping him for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile at Churchill Downs. He had to be shipped home after that because he got sick and didn't manage to run in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. And since then, it's just been a process to get this horse at his best. The diligence, the work that Shug he has put in with Johnny Velazquez to get this horse to, to campaign him the way he has this entire year and set him up for a performance in the Breeders' Cup Classic, I just think is incredible. And I, he's a horse that you, you know, have to respect given his campaign this year. Well, especially because Shug McGay, he's one of the most successful trainers in the history of the Breeders' Cup. He knows as well as anyone, if not better, how to get a horse ready for this race. And he's not going to shoehorn one in. If they're not ready, to, if they don't fit, he's not going to try and, you know, go backwards on it and try to, you know, reverse engineer a campaign that didn't call for this. So Code of Honor going where he belongs. Uh, you know, we were talking to Riley Mott about a late you know the, the highlight of her season it may have been a runner-up finish because the personal ensign still probably on the short list for race of the year between her and midnight bisu was as magical a performance from her as we've seen even though she came second 
A lot of the time we go into a race hoping that some sort of duel will happen between the best two horses in the race, and it never transpires. Well, it definitely happened in this year's running of the Grade 1 Personal Ensign. This was an absolute throwdown. We see a late on the inside, Midnight Bisu closing from off of the pace. Neither one of them wanted to give it to the other. Right. Unfortunately, you know, a late's probably just a bit better at a mile and a quarter, whereas uh, Midnight Bisu is probably a bit better at nine for longs but this was a throwdown and you have to respect her i mean the only thing that i can uh, is a concern for me is a late's performance in the grade one spinster she was a heavy favorite in there that said blue prize who's going to the breeders cup to staff she loves keeneland she got the right type of trip and i guess it's you know you, you can't really compare the two because a late's a completely different horse at the mile and a quarter Right, and her, her performances at a mile and a quarter are, are, are very good. So I, yeah. I, I don't blame anybody for taking a shot this year, and especially with a late. One of the more interesting stories has been Mongolian Groom. People want to color this as an underdog story, a horse who, you know, really you know announced himself in the awesome again. I know he hadn't won a grade one prior, but this was a horse who was third in the big cap. He was second in the San Diego. He was third in the Pacific Classic. He ran well in the Woodward behind Preservationist, and then he comes with this performance to defeat McKenzie, and really Abel Cedillo just took it to him early and never relinquished. This was an incredible performance for sure. Uh, he was forwardly placed in this race. Uh, I mean, obviously you have to think about him at nine furlongs versus the mile and a quarter, but the, what they've accomplished with this horse, as you mentioned, Mike, he, they've been so close to graded stakes before in the past, and he finally got that elusive grade one victory in the awesome again stakes at Santa Anita. They were originally not going to run in the Breeders' Cup Classic and take him to Japan, but the connections putting up the $200,000 to supplement him into the Breeders' Cup Classic clearly is a vote of confidence. $200,000 is a lot of money to anybody, yeah. but especially considering Mongolian stable, they're not the largest stable in the world. They have won a couple of Breeders' Cup races, or they have won a Breeders' Cup race in the past, but for them to put up that money, this horse has only earned $533,000 this year. His career earnings are under six hundred grand. Mongolian Groom, the connections putting up $200,000, that is not insignificant, and they already had a path chosen for him, so for them to put up this kind of money and change course to stay in the Breeders' Cup tells me this horse is very live. It's a story, uh, well, it's a race full of different types of stories. I mean, a late going against the boys, code of honor, coming back after disappointment last year in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, not being able to um, make it McKinsey, who kind of yep. has to rebound off of his last race. And then even Owendale, who I think is kind of a blue collar type of horse here, Mike. Look, the Oklahoma Derby races at Remington Park. They have been trying to build these races as preps for the Breeders' Cup. Um, the Oklahoma Derby with Owendale winning here. This has been a productive race over the years, and the, the racing at Remington Park is an outstanding product. And on their biggest days, they attract some awesome horses, and Owendale was awesome this night. Well, he's always been right there. He won the Grade 3 Lexington. Then he came back to run really, really strongly against War of Will in the Preakness. He ultimately won the Grade 3 Ohio Derby and then got another graded stakes race to his name in the Oklahoma Derby last time out. But, you know, he definitely has to take a big step up. He has to improve in order to compete with some of the top contenders in here. But you have to, you have to respect his resiliency and his consistency coming into a race like this. And then there's Yoshida, the uh, talented Japanese horse for Bill Mott, owned by the China Horse Club. Winner of the Woodward in 2018, third in the Woodward this year, was fourth, don't forget, fourth in that Breeders' Cup Classic behind Accelerate last year, and, you know, second in the Whitney to McKinsey. And Yoshida, even though not a win machine in, in this country, um, five for 17 lifetime and takes on the biggest names in our sport regularly. He just has no early pace. He's got one style of running, and there's no way of taking him out of that. Belmont has said that several times before in the past. Um, so he's just going to need the right trip, and he's going to need some pace involved in front of him. He is always right there, as you mentioned, but, you know, it, it does just boil down to Yoshida whether or not he gets the right trip. Hey, 10 out of 17 times he's finished in the money. His earnings over $2 million. He's run in the Dubai World Cup, the... Pegasus, and this will be his second Breeders' Cup Classic. All right, let's uh, switch gears here. Let's go back a race or so for the Longines Breeders' Cup turf as we take a look. You, you took us through the uh, the pre-entries here, but every year the European contingent as strong in this race as any other. Yep. 
Oh, for sure. I mean, even last year, of course, talking about the great Enable coming here stateside, we will not be seeing her this year, but we do have the likes of Magical and a matchup between her and likely Bricks and Mortar. He has that second preference in the Breeders' Cup Mile and Magical with that second preference in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf. Uh, Bricks and Mortar, what can you say about this horse? I mean, he it could be argued that he is the best horse in the country. Well, I, I thought it was interesting that this year he's won four races worth a million dollars or more. I don't know how often that's been done. Uh, he won the Arlington Million. He won the Manhattan Stakes uh, on Belmonte. And he's just a machine. And you can't say enough about the patience of Chad Brown. This horse had an extensive layoff. It was really tough to get this horse fit and ready to roll. And he, when he hits the racetrack, is virtually unbeatable. We'll see how he stacks up against the Euros, but they better bring their running shoes if they're gonna take on bricks and mortar. I mean, magical, I guess, is really where the conversation starts. Uh, she obviously um, almost, well, I shouldn't say almost, but she did almost upset uh, Enable in the Coral Eclipse. She ran second to Enable in this race last year, too. So, Mike, I'll ask, I'll pose this question to you. Bricks and mortar versus Enable. I I don't really know. I mean, I would I would say Enable last year <laughs> bricks and mortar this year i don't know does he if he goes to the arc i mean if he goes to, to europe it takes her on, on on her own turf i don't know if she comes here and has to run at santa anita probably go bricks and mortar it here's a look at that that coral eclipse stakes uh, magical she's sensationally talented and ryan moore has just done a brilliant job riding her throughout the year uh, of course, and uh, then she went on to face foes in the Grade One Arc de uh, the Arc de Triomphe, and unfortunately did not have a good showing there. But she comes back to this on a firm going, which we know that she likes. She can run on any type of going, but she'll get that rock hard, hard surface here at Santa Anita. And I, you know, you can't really, you definitely can't ignore her. I, looking at this race, I think it's between those two. Um, even Arklo, I think, has been a, a horse that's been in very good form, but he just kind of looks a, a notch below. Um, there's definitely some interesting European interests, but Magical, of course, I would say is the headliner there. So you close out the weekend with the Breeders, the Longines Breeders Cup Distaff, the Longines Breeders Cup Turf, and the Longines Breeders Cup Classic. Mm -hmm. You have Midnight Bisu in the Distaff. You have Bricks and Mortar in the Turf. And you have Code of Honor and Mackenzie in the Classic. Vino Rosso throw them in there. You have those three races could determine Horse of the Year. If Midnight Bisu wins, if Bricks and Mortar wins, and then let's say a Mackenzie or a Code of Honor wins, yeah. how do you vote? The Eclipse Awards, how do and you vote? And then even Omaha Beach, right? Omaha Beach for three in, in the mile for, for three year olds. But you could have a three consecutive races. And this is what the Breeders' Cup was designed for. Year-end championships for our sport. The last three races on Championship Saturday could very well, will very well, determine the Eclipse Award for Champion Horse. So much have has been in flux over the course of the past year. Horses have taken turns beating each other. And, you know, I think this weekend really will determine so much in hindsight for the year. I mean, especially the three-year-old of the year, Code of Honor versus Omaha Beach. I think I'm most excited to see how that kind of pans out. If Midnight Bisu wins the distaff, if Bricks and Mortar wins the turf, can a horse win the Classic and still be Horse of the Year in the U.S.? Or is it going to be one of those two? Oh, that's a good question. Not to get ahead of ourselves, that's but the question. next nine days is all about getting ahead of ourselves. That's <laughs> all really we're going is. to do here on this network is get ahead of ourselves if we look forward to the Breeders' Cup. Um, let's. My producer wanted me to talk about a different thing. I think he wanted to talk about the TBG Mile. The TBG okay. Mile. That's what he wanted to go I, I couldn't hear him over you. I know. That's That happens <laughs> often. Welcome to TVG. The TVG Breeders' Cup Mile. Here's a here's a look at the uh, pre-entries. We went through them earlier. Um, every year, a, a fantastic race. Bolo, Bowie's Hero couple of local horses yeah, and you know Carla Gaines even said with Bolo like why why ship out of town and try and run in races when clearly his best races are at Santa Anita he's a little long in the tooth but when he shows his most brilliant turn of foot god is he tough to beat he really is. I mean, it, what's interesting about this race is we have kind of a, a mix up of horses who still have a lot to prove, but horse, other horses like Bolo, who have just been so consistent throughout their entire career. And he's had to overcome some obstacles in his career. And it's just amazing to see Carla Gaines campaign him and get him to win uh, this grade one shoemaker mile. Uh, you know, I think he's one of many that could win the Breeders' Cup mile this year, Mike.
Uh, oftentimes, you talk about you know who's a better trainer, who's a better such and such. More often than not in this sport, as you know, it's trainer matching up with horse, right? Is Zenyatta still Zenyatta? Does she win 19 in a row if it's somebody other than John Sheriffs and his training style? Does, you know, Pleasantly Perfect win a Breeders' Cup Classic with the training style of somebody other than a Richard Mandel? Does Beholder take home statues for three consecutive years at ages two, three, four, five with anybody other than Richard Mandela? You know who I'm really interested in is Uni. Okay. Um, it, if we actually have the grade one first lady uh, last time out at Keeneland, she ran exceptionally well. Now, you could look at that race and think, okay, well, really, what did she beat? Well, she she beat Basilica in there. She beat other graded stakes winners, other grade one winners, and she came with this massive run from off of the pace. Now, she did get a good pace in front of her, but she's been able to get grade ones or at least grade one placings everywhere. I mean, she won the grade one at Del Mar in the Matriarch. She's run well at Keeneland before in the past. I thought she ran well in the Four Star Dave, just didn't get the right type of trip. I wanted to show this first lady because Sometimes we like to compare the girl, the ladies against the boys. She could have won the Shadowell Turf Mile. Absolutely, she could have. Absolutely, she could have. I, I completely concur with that. That was brilliant. Look, that, that pace helped her to get to the front. That, those final three lengths she put on him, that was all her. That was all her. And she has... But uh, that was a win in your end for the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf. So the connection's yeah. opting for the mile going against the boys where I think she fits. It's an embarrassment of riches as it usually is on the turf for Chad Brown as he has not only Uni, um, Bricks and Mortar clearly looking like that mile and a quarter or the, the the distance of the turf is going to be just as they, people have talked about bricks and mortars having distance limitations i don't think a mile and a half is going to hurt them. no i don't think so at all no. um at any rate that's the look at the pre-entries for the tvg breeders cup mile but once again this gave us you know a couple of horses of the year well the same horse twice with wise dan that's right it's been a very very strong race and even um you know, thinking back to Goldakova, Goldakova, Teppin. There's some outside. I don't know Teppin. Yeah. I think the first I time I met her. you, you let me feed Teppin peppermints. Uh, at any rate, <laughs> I don't uh, remember that. Let's take a look at the uh, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile because capping off day one, TVG Breeders' Cup Juvenile um, has been a pretty good indicator. It took until 2007 for the Juvenile to give us a, a Breeders' or a Kentucky Derby winner, 2006 winner. Street Sense would win the Derby, 2007. Um, Bob Baffert has won this race several times, and he's got a good one with eight rings. Borderline great one in the two-year-old ranks. Yeah, and this is him winning the grade one American Pharaoh last time out. Things went awry at Del Mar. We talked to Bob Baffert earlier on this show, and he mentioned that concern, especially even having that conversation with Johnny Velasquez and saying this horse is, a, you know, a little quirky. You have to be careful. But he suited him to a T. The interesting thing about this horse coming down the stretch here, Mike, is how he switches leads. And even Bob Baffert, within the interview with Christina Blacker, um, mentioning that he's still green, he still has room to grow. And to me, I don't know if that was a greenness thing coming down the stretch or if it was more so he got a lot out of it in terms of fitness. Because technically, he's stretching out from five eighths to a mile and a 16th over a course here at Santa Anita who that has been a little bit deeper and more um, arduous recently. So, you know, I think that's a good platform for him to move forward. Talking about other superstars, Maxfield, most recently in the grade one breeders. Is, is it Derby. hyperbole to say that the breeders futurity that he ran is the best race we've seen from a two year old in 2019? Everybody loves a last to first type of move. But it's right? last the first, and he wins by five. And he, <laughs> he just, look, look at this. It's like they're standing still. I know. And Governor Morris was in there for Todd Pletcher, who ran that flashy race at Saratoga. I, I thought overall it was a very strong field. So, you know, sometimes people look at a performance like that and ask, well, what did he beat? I actually thought he beat a decent grouping of horses. Um, the one thing he's going to have to overcome, Mike, is getting out of the gate. And both of his first his both of his starts he doesn't get out of the gate and he finds himself with so much left to do it's a concern with how santa anita historically has played on the main track i will say this though the two things that are super encouraging about that that i don't think anybody's really talked about is one he runs the turn mm -hmm. okay so at santa anita if you're going to win going two turns you have to run the turns here. Yeah. There's just, you can't just can't just idle and, and run down the straights that's number one so he made his move on the turn number two 
that was the first finish line and he won by five. Yeah. He didn't run down the stretch and pull away by five. That's the first finish line and he won by five. That's a good point. Uh, Very short stretch at right. Keelan. So he showed that athleticism to just kind of spurt home. Even Dennis's moment, we really haven't talked much about him either, but you could argue that the race really will maybe fall in between those three. Well, it's a one hour show. We need all nine days to talk about every horse in the Breeders' Cup. That's just about uh, how awesome it is. Give me a race that you are looking forward to most. What race, either Friday or Saturday, what do you think is, boy, I just, I mean, I know it's hard. It's like trying to pick your favorite child. It's the second one. I'm trying to pick your favorite child, but which race are you looking more forward to most? Um, I'm really interested to see Matoli. Okay. I really am. Right. I mean, I, I kind of been following him. I don't know. It's hard to say because there there are so many superstars this year like Matoli, like Omaha Beach, mm -hmm. and the year that Omaha Beach has had coming back. The classic is interesting with the presence of Elate and Code of Honor and McKinsey. I, in the past uh, couple of years, I've always loved the Breeders' Cup Juvenile because you see these stars mm -hmm. in the making. It's a tough question because each of them are interesting in their own right, but I am very much looking forward to seeing Matoli. There's uh, three things you can count on in life. Death, taxes, and a freak performance in the Met Mile. And that's what we got from Matoli. Um, let's take a look at that race. Every year, it just seems like the highest buyer speed figure, the lowest thoroughbred number comes out of the Met Mile. And Matoli didn't disappoint. He did not. He, he really hasn't disappointed that much this year as a whole. Uh, we can see him in between horses here under uh, Jackie Ricardo Santana. And, you know, he just keeps trying. He's just laying it all down on the line here. And he somehow finds a second wind after kind of being positioned in between several horses on the front end. He gets the job done. I like the move to not go to the two turn mile, a dirt mile, excuse me, and cut him back to the one turn sprint. And I have not seen the work myself, but I heard he worked really well here at Santa Anita. Really hard to watch that run Happy Met Mile and not have your eyes drawn to McKenzie and all that trouble you had coming out late. But once again, Matoli's speed was the reason why he didn't have trouble. Here's a look at the programming coming up over the next nine days. You will not see a lead up to the Breeders' Cup as you've seen before. This is something far greater than we have ever done, and 2019 assures to be one of the best years in Breeders' Cup history with everything that TVG is putting behind it. You saw the pre-entries today. We have breakfast at the Breeders' Cup presented by TVG Friday the 25th through Halloween, the Breeders' Cup post-position draw on Monday, and then the Handicappers preview show. We will preview Friday on Thursday. We will preview Saturday on Friday, and you can watch all this action on TVG. You can watch the Breeders' Cup on TVG. And you can wager on all the action at TVG.com. For Christina and Gabby, I'm Mike. Thank you for joining us for the Breeders' Cup pre-entries here on TVG.